When I was growing up, I actually desperately wanted to be a horse rider. Um, had a huge passion in show jumping and was convinced that I was going to go to the very top in show jumping. Then I changed all that and decided that I actually wanted to be an actress and a singer. Um, and falling into presenting happened by total chance and I am so happy that that happened. I absolutely love this industry. What I love about this particular industry is um, the amount of incredible people that I've met along the way. I get to travel the world and play with the most ridiculously awesome cars. It just couldn't be better. Well, this is my home. Uh, this is where I spend my time when I'm not traveling. Um, it's lovely. It's very calm. It's very nice. Um, and it's like one big animal farm. When I was 19, I went to theatre school, a place called Red Roofs in Maidenhead. And while I was there, I applied for a job in the local newspaper looking for an events organiser. And I had a, a call from the person behind the advert and he said, um, I'm based in Maidenhead, so I'm nice and local to you. Can you come over and have a coffee and we'll have a chat? So I turned up at this house, saw a couple of very nice cars in the driveway and sat down with uh, this gentleman who turned out to be Graham Clark and he owns a track day company called RMA Limited. And that really was the beginning of, of the whole thing. He said, excellent, can you come and meet us on Friday morning? We're gonna be driving to Spa, Francorchamps. And so I did, I turned up on Friday morning, I didn't actually realize what or where Spa Francorchamps was or indeed really what I was gonna be doing. But turned up on Friday morning, got into his uh, 911 Porsche and took the seven hour journey to Spa. And that was it, I was hooked. <laughs> Graham said, do you wanna go and grab a lid and uh, we'll put you in some of the cars? I was like, what? How is that possible? He said, yeah, 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 passenger rides and all that. Got to play with the most ridiculous people. Adrian Newey, Anthony Reid, Piers Maserati, Mark Webber was one of the instructors there. They have a, a, a sort of a half an hour slot for beginners. And uh, Graham could see that I was already in love with the industry and said, uh, right, Anthony wants to take you out in the Porsche Boxster. So I went over, went to get in the car, in the passenger side, and Anthony was like, what are you doing? No, 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 come round, it's the beginner's lap. We're gonna put you in the driver's seat. I have never driven a car like this sort of thing at all in my life, so it was, it was pretty nerve wracking. Spa is a driver's all time favorite track because there is a section in it called Eau Rouge. You have a very sharp um, hairpin bend called La Source, and that goes down to a very, very steep down and up. Um, and the G-force going through there is completely ridiculous. First time round, go down, come back up, that's all good. Second time I come round La Source and I'm just coming down into Eau Rouge, only I've got a little bit uh, um, too excitable. Um, so put my foot far too much on the throttle, have absolutely no car control whatsoever, come round La Source and spin very nicely down the hill into Eau Rouge and uh, I ended about, probably about two meters away from the wall. Knowing that you've got a lot of money in your hands there and you're heading towards the wall is pretty scary. <laughs> the week after Spa, um, Graham once again asked, said, okay, went, went very well. What are you up to this Friday? Nothing. Okay, could you possibly come to my house once again? And this time we're going to the Nürburgring. The track is described as the Green Hell by Jackie Stewart. It's the most terrifying circuit. Graham introduced me to the Queen of the Ring, and the Queen of the Ring is Sabine Schmitz. And this girl, this woman can drive. And this particular weekend, quite a lot of the RMA members were actually going out to do their National B Racing License. Come here, Lucky Dukes. Come here. Graham said, um, well, let's put you in a car, we'll spend the first couple of days, we'll, we'll teach you, and then, you know, effectively you can jump on to the course and, uh, and you can kind of do your racing license. 
Driving with Sabine Schmitz was a, was a great experience. This woman is the queen of the ring. Um, you really can't get taught by a better person around a circuit like that. Sabine has balls of steel. <laughs> she can drive and she pushes you to the absolute max. As far as she was concerned, she had a woman in the, in the car and she really, really wanted to help me, really wanted to give me confidence. Um, to the point though, that if I wasn't going fast enough, she would lean over and push her hand on my leg. She was like, go, 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 go. Pushed her hand on my knee, just to make sure that my foot was flat to the floor. This is my wonderful beast. This is my Audi TT. I absolutely love, but uh, bless him, he's, he's, he's struggling a little bit. Got a hole here, which I've cleverly covered up with, with gaffer tape. The car is unlocked, but the passenger door doesn't open. <laughs> and it needs a clean. But it's the best car in the world. <laughs> oh, poor little Toby. <laughs> a friend of mine came to me with a Grazia magazine, and in it was an advert looking for um, Formula Unas. Um, now, the Formula Una is something that Red Bull Formula One created. The idea is that instead of having grid girls, they um, have sort of glorified grid girls, but people who will come along, drink Red Bull and mingle. There was an interview process, there were a few different challenges that we had to do in the Red Bull offices, and seven of us were selected then to go to Silverstone to the Formula One Grand Prix. That sound of the cars for a start was just completely incredible. We were hanging out with David Coulthard, Mark Webber, uh, Jodie Kidd, Eddie Jordan came and took selfies with us. We got to drive tanks and shoot guns and just do lots of cool stuff. Oh, it was so much fun. 2010 was probably my most pivotal time. Um, I was working as a full-time teacher. I'd pretty much given up the performing industry. I just started dabbling in the music industry, but presenting really wasn't on my radar at all. But there was a national competition that uh, the radio were offering called BBC Introducing. They ran a, a sort of a competition between three artists that they'd selected, and I actually ended up winning that competition. And then it was by absolute fluke. I was in London once, and I, and I had met up with my old agent, and he said, Al, do you know what? You need to start being the yes girl. I was like, okay, all right. About an hour after I'd had lunch with him, I had a phone call from a woman who I'd met a few years before, and she said, um, you present, don't you? And I heard my agent in my ear going, be the yes girl, say yes. I was like, yeah. Are you free this evening? Yes. Oh, brilliant, okay, because my presenter's just pulled out and we want you to come and present Miss Great Britain. Oh, okay, all right. Can you get here at Hoppers 4? Yes, where? Come to Maya nightclub, we'll get you put into a gown, we'll give you a script, you'll meet your co-presenter and then you'll be on stage at Hopper 7. It was brilliant, it was the best thing, like totally changed my life. So I went that evening, did it, completely fell in love with the industry. Within three months I had left my full-time job, um, I'd moved out of my house, moved to London, got a tiny studio flat and pursued the world um, of presenting. The first live presenting gig that I did was for a channel called Smart Life Casino. They were crazy long shifts, they were eight hours, and they were all live. So if anything went wrong, you just had to carry on going. So that really was the best training for my career as a presenter, because um, quite frankly, nothing could be harder. <laughs> well, these are our alpacas. I'd like you to meet Pepe and Teo. Pepe's a bit camera shy. Pepe! I'd love to give you a, a brilliant reason as to why we've got them, but I don't have one. They're just good fun to have. I'd say McLaren Formula One was probably the toughest gig I've ever done. The idea was that I did a three hour tour around the McLaren Technology Centre. So I spoke about the Technology Centre, I spoke about the boulevard, the cars dating all the way back to Bruce McLaren era, all the way up to, to then, which was Lewis Hamilton and Jensen Button. Then I would take sponsors and guests around to the wind tunnel, 
to learn about carbon fiber, to learn about calibration, uh, the trophy selection, absolutely everything. So it was really tough. Lewis and Jensen were lovely. I got to have a chat to them. I also got to spend quite a lot of time down in the fitness area and just see how hard it was for them and what training they were doing. Working for McLaren was um, a real opportunity for me and it really opened a lot of doors. I was learning loads and loads about the industry and a lot about racing drivers as well. And it's funny because there was a forum that I saw online and someone had asked the question whether racing drivers were athletes or not. And it had about 30 comments underneath and most people were saying, no, nope, they're definitely not. And that inspired me to write a documentary on what it takes to be a racing driver. I wrote the treatment and I contacted a channel called The Active Channel and said to them, I want to make this treatment, would you be interested in doing it? And they really were keen. And that led me to spend some time with various different racing drivers. I went down to Lydon Hill, spent some time in the World of Rallycross and met Liam Duran and Pat Duran. I went to British Touring Car, spent some time with Rob Collard and Tom Onslow Cole and learned the world of British Touring Car. Went to various different industries basically. I wanted to get a cross section of, of the different championships and, uh, and what it took to be a racing driver. So that continued and, and that also opened up lots of doors for me. When I was at the British Touring Car Press Day, I met a gentleman called Nick, uh, Nick Barnett, and he was the producer of Race TV. And he then asked me to go and present a number of UK racing championships. And that was my first launch into actually doing stuff properly for television, because then my career at Motors TV started. And it was through Motors TV that I got my biggest break yet. Motors TV gave me one of my biggest opportunities in the motor industry. They asked me to present the Le Mans Classic. At that point, I had never done any classic car stuff at all. I really had to learn fast. My co-presenter was Alan Decadene, who was um, a, quite a prolific classic driver. The two of us were gonna be hosting the live studio show for four days. We had some incredible people come in and sit on the sofa and chat to us. The likes of Jean Todd, the head of FIA, Richard Mille, um, Gregor Fiskin, just some incredible drivers. After presenting the Le Mans Classic, um, the next biggest opportunity that I had was to present a YouTube channel called Fast, Furious and Funny. So I was contacted by the production company um, and told that my co-presenters would be Rory Reid and Colin Furs. And what ensued then was a year of absolute chaos and carnage. We spent all our time blowing cars up, racing ridiculous cars, wrapping incredible cars, and dropping things like watermelons on cars to flatten them. We had a great time presenting that show. Um, Colin Furs, many people absolutely love him um, because he is one of the most craziest humans on the planet. He has a Guinness World Record for the fastest mobility scooter. He'd bring whatever gadget it was that he was currently working on. And I remember when he was pushing the world's fastest mobility scooter because we raced a rocket against him, which he beat. He would do some really stupid things. He'd turn up in a baby grow and but he would come with various different gadgets that he'd been tinkering with. And Rory was incredible too. I remember I had a really fond memory of chatting to Rory. It was pouring with rain and we're sitting in the back of a Land Rover. He's sitting there and I said, you know, what is it that you want to do? What do you want to go into? And he said, Al, all I want to do is present Top Gear. He said, that is like my be all and end all. One day I am going to present Top Gear. And sure enough, he is now the main presenter on Top Gear. Hello. Well, this is Sunny. Uh, I still ride him. Not as often as I'd like to, because I'm never here. Oh, hello, Chips. And this is Chips. <laughs> you all right, guys? Do you like being on camera, do you? Anything with horsepower, basically. <laughs> hey! <laughs> 
start of 2013, I was also offered a job to present the World Rally Cross. And that was, again, a real step up in my career because that was the first time that I was going to be presenting on Eurosport. And it took me all around Europe, Norway, Finland, all these incredible tracks. And that was my bug for travel ticked. <laughs> so 2014 kicked off and I was offered the job to present the World Touring Car Championship covering 14 different countries, a race circuit in each country, and some of the best drivers in the world. And I would start every round um, doing a lap of each circuit in the safety car, which was an Alfa Romeo. And each time I did that, I was given one of these world touring car drivers to sit beside me and teach me. And that really gave me a bit more confidence to get behind the wheel again. Um, I really enjoyed it and just wanted to do more and more. So I created a project called The Rise of the UK Wildcats and the concept was to get as many uh, feisty women together as I could and then start doing exciting projects. At the start of 2016, I was approached by a lovely lady called Benedict Clarkson and she said, how would you be interested in coming and driving in the rally Marrakesh Sahara? So I contacted my friend Hayley. She went to theatre school with me. She's, um, she was part of the, the sort of the Wildcats clan anyway. Very feisty, um, very driven girl. And she's also a driving instructor, so it kind of worked in quite well. To start a rally Marrakesh Sahara, you uh, actually have to get yourself to the base camp and that in itself is hard enough. It's a seven hour drive from Morocco to the base camp. However, it's through the Atlas Mountains, which is really hard, and what you don't take into consideration is that you're probably going to get lost. And we did, we got very lost, and then we started running out of fuel. And so by the time we actually hit the desert area, we had pretty much run out of fuel. We managed to ask a local, managed to get the fuel, managed to come back to the desert, and then within about 10 minutes of hitting the sands, we got stuck. Driving the sand is really very different to driving in any other terrain. And unless you know how to do it, you can't. <laughs> Luckily, we had a pretty good car, so we were able to get ourselves out of quite a lot of scrapes. We were in a Toyota Land Cruiser Prado, which actually coped with the desert a lot better than quite a lot of the other people's cars who were constantly getting stuck. Um, our biggest problem was navigation. Every day we were given um, a bunch of coordinates so we had a compass and a map, no GPS, nothing at all, and no phone signal. Haley and I had been driving on the Wednesday for about seven hours, and we were due to be back at camp about 5 p.m. We got very lost, and when you're in the desert, it's very, very difficult to find your bearings, and I think it probably took us about four hours to manage to uh, make our way back to camp. Quite an entertaining time. By the time we got to the last day, we were at absolutely exhausted. Totally exhilarated. We'd seen and done some incredible things, but pff, it was really, really tiring. We'd got really into it. We knew we knew how the car was going and we were absolutely gunning it towards the finish line area. We could see another Land Rover that we were coming up to. We were able to pass them and that was great because we didn't actually know at that point where we'd come in the rally either. Um, all we knew is the finish line was in sight and, and we would be able to, to get through, get some rest and, and celebrate what was just the most incredible experience. Crossing the finish line after being pushed to your extremes was just the, the most exhilarating moment. Haley and I have known each other for, for 20 years and we're really, really good pals, but that week, threw things at us that nothing else has ever done before. Later on that night, all of the teams came together and there was a sort of celebration evening, but no one really knew where they came because it wasn't a competition of speed, it was a competition of shortest kilometers. We got together and uh, we came third. It was incredible. This way, this way, wee, 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 wee. <gasps> wee, wee, looky, 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 looky. <laughs> These are my two crazy cockapoos. This is Luca and this is Rio. And they're very naughty. Rally Marrakesh Sahara was without a doubt one of the biggest highlights of my life. Um, 
and it was not long before one of the biggest highlights of my career as well, because I was actually asked to present the live screens at the Singapore F1 2016. That was a step up in my career that I just never expected to happen. And five of the hardest days I've ever had in my career as well. I was presenting alongside um, Ben Constanturos, who's another motorsports presenter that I've worked with before, so it was nice, we had a really good team. I was down in the pits, so he would be up in the studio and he'd throw down to me in the pit lane. So my job was to get as many interviews as I possibly could do. That meant interviewing the scary drivers. <laughs> Singapore F1 is a night race. Um, so the drivers are actually given a curfew. They're not allowed through the turnstiles until 3 p.m. So at 3, all of the media stand and wait for the drivers to come through. Um, and on the first day, the first man that came through was Alonso. Now, he might not be the fastest on track, but he is by far the fastest walker on the planet. What I realised at the end of my first horrifically bad interview with him was that um, I was going to have to pick up my pace a little bit. But it was nice, it was fun, because come Sunday, I had learnt this a little bit more and actually decided that I would just sort of run along ahead of him and that made him chuckle because uh, he had to keep up with me then. <laughs> Currently, I've got a lot coming up. I'm going to do another year in the World Touring Car Championship. I am about to go out to Norway to do some ice driving. I'm hoping to do another rally this year and hopefully do some more stuff with Formula One and some other championships. Um, Long term, I don't know. I'd like to get behind the wheel more often. And I really, really want to do the Dakar. I intend to do that. And then who knows? I just don't know. I'm open to all sorts of opportunities. I don't think I would do anything differently. I absolutely love this career that I'm in. I love the industry. I've been given some of the most incredible opportunities. I get to travel the world. I get to meet incredible people and I get to play with fast cars. What can you not love about that? <laughs>